Now on BBC News, Hard Talk asks tough questions in interviews with people who are shaping the news. Welcome to Hard Talk from Johannesburg. I'm Stephen Sacker. For 29 years, South Africa's national politics has been dominated by the African National Congress. But right now, the ANC is in big trouble. A protracted energy crisis is doing further damage to an economy already hit by shocking levels of unemployment, inequality and corruption. Now, if the ANC is faltering, who is best placed to offer an alternative? Well, my guest today is Julius Malema, leader of the radical populist economic freedom fighters. If Malema were to get even a share of power, what would that mean for South Africa? Julius Malema, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Mr. Malema. We are speaking as South Africa is in the middle of an energy crisis. It seems set to get worse. Mm -hmm. What do you think it is doing to this country? Well, uh, its aim is to collapse this country and undermine the democratic project because those in power have uh, relegated their responsibilities to who we don't know. They have not maintained uh, the power stations. They have not built the new ones that are functional. And um, as a result, we are where we are. The interim CEO uh, of ESCOM, the state-owned energy company, yes. said yesterday that over the coming months of winter, they might get to a stage eight situation, which means there could be power cuts for pretty much 12 or more hours per day. But you have gone further. You have said that you think the grid will collapse. In fact, you said South Africa is going to be plunged into darkness within two weeks. Why, why are you exaggerating? I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I said this before they told you there was a stage eight coming. The stage eight is to prepare you that the worst are coming. And I'm say, telling you the truth as is. What is it that can avoid the collapse of the grid, which they've done in between. Which station have they built that is functional uh, to its uh, um, uh, expectation? Uh, which station have they maintained? If they said, this one, we're closing it down, we're going to engage in major maintenance of this station. Nothing major has been done. But your statements could spread panic. Is that what you want? No, I'm not uh, uh, spreading panic. I'm telling the truth. Stage eight, they are just being polite. They are, we are going to go, and you are talking hours, we are going to go days without electricity. It's a reality that we need to deal with. Even after announcing stage eight, um, the manner they did, which ANC politician have you seen panicking? Which a president have you seen calling at the nation into confidence about what is really happening. Is no, it? we hear from uh, 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 officials as if we don't have elected leadership of this country. On March 20th, you uh, declared a national shutdown. You tried to shut down the entire economy in the midst of this power crisis. Is that responsible? That is the most responsible thing to do. You want me to fold my hands? Do you want me to not do anything? What will history say about me? I'm going to be asked a question, not by you, by the future generation, as to what have you done when South Africa was in a crisis? The most uh, logical thing to do is for the president to resign. Eh? Was it in Britain where we saw prime ministers in, in a short space of time resigning one after another because they realized they were not about to carry the national agenda. The president is not carrying the national agenda. We need a, a government of national unity constituted by all of us who are not driven by political party uh, interest, 
but the interest of South Africa to resolve this immediate crisis, which will, as, which will affect all aspects of our life. National unity, yes. you say. You also said at the time of the national shutdown, this shutdown is the beginning of a revolution. No one can stop it. No army can stop it. No police can stop it. Some of your members put out videos threatening to beat up teachers and police if they went to work. One even threatened to beat up pupils if they went to school. And you talk to me about national unity? But that video of a person who was uh, threatening to beat up pupils if they go to school is an old video. I think uh, Hard Talk should have done its research to now realize that video has been resurfaced to support a certain narrative. There's no such a thing. I'm telling you there's going to be a revolution. Let the grid collapse and let's see what's going to happen. Let the this. grid collapse. I'm saying to you. How do you think South Africans are going to feel hearing no, you I'm say saying, that? I'm people saying, who are losing their jobs, no, people you're, who you're, have no, no income. You're and you just say, me. You are misinterpreting me. I'm saying to you, let the grid collapse as it is going to happen and see what's going to happen in this country. I'm not wishing it. I'm saying it's going to happen. And you will see what's going to happen. Do you think that once the grid collapse, uh, people are going to exchange roses with government? People are going to rise. And when they rise, there will not be any leader who will be leading them. There will be leaderless. There will be anarchy. There will be looting all over this country because nothing will be working. So if you think that I was bluffing on the 20th of March, I was just saying to this government, and the people of South Africa, something ought to be done to avoid what is possibly coming, which is going to be a leaderless revolution. That's very powerful rhetoric. But the truth is, on 20th of March, according to employers, 70% of workers across the country went to work. One political commentator said that actually the failure of the national shutdown was a, quote, humiliation for Malema. From where we're sitting, the shutdown was successful. Nothing was operating. The South African media was at the public transport, power taxi ranks, at bus ranks. The taxi drivers themselves, the bus drivers themselves have said, we showed up, but there are no people. So if you are going to listen to a desktop, most possibly a racist analysis, of wanting to undermine the narrative of the success of the shutdown, then that's your own uh, baby to nurse. But the reality is that nothing functioned on that day. You can go to the public broadcaster, mm. you can go to independent media uh, outlets in South Africa to give you the footage of the day, every corner. And what even makes me happy is that even in the rural areas, where normally the revolution never takes place, the people were out in their numbers saying, enough, it's enough. Let's think about the lessons to be drawn from the current crisis. Because yes. what we see is a state-operated energy giant which is failing to work. It is not delivering power to the people. We have other major state-operated companies, for example, Transnet in the transport and logistics sector, which are failing the people of South Africa. One, we could look at the aviation sector, all sorts of sectors yes. where the state has failed. And yet your message is you still want to confiscate all privately owned land, essentially nationalize all privately owned land. You want to nationalize the mines, you want to nationalize the banking sector, and these are the key pillars of South Africa's economy. You want them all in state hands, and you, Julius Malema, are saying to the South African people, elect me, and I and my associates in the economic freedom fighters will run this economy. Absolutely. You know, 95% of South Africa is electrified. Do you know that South Africa gets water today? Do you know that South Africans, they're watching a public broadcaster? All these examples I've given you are but, state owned. But do you know there is that a, we have seen this experiment played out is, in other countries? I'm thinking I, of I, Zimbabwe, I'm thinking of Venezuela. And the model does not look good to many South African people who see it. You know, it looks good. We're using it now. We were better off now owning this. 
It's not like I'm saying, let's go and take ESCOM out of the hands of the private sector. We are owning it already. So, I and then South that. Africans have accepted and are happy with what we're we are. it already that's and it's why a South Africans, uh, That's why South Africans are saying, let's get proper people to go and run these institutions. Are you, the proper, not, are you the proper person? I'm a proper guy. I mean, I don't want to go too far back into history, but at various times you failed to actually file a tax return on time. Yeah. You've been accused of different financial offences. You've never been convicted, yeah. but those, some of those yeah. uh, charges were never brought to court. But you tell South Africans, despite your own history, yeah. you are the guy to run their economy. That's why. That's a mind of a lazy person who doesn't do his work. You, you will have to refer back to 15 years. I'm, I've grown up uh -huh. over a period of time, build a solid political party. The only thing you can keep on referring to is what you interviewed me about it 12 years ago. Get something new, my brother. No, I'm very... Show a skill of an, a hard-working presenter who does his research. You can't falter me. Since I've made my mistakes on tax when I was very young, when I was almost 27 years old, fixed that problem today, I'm a 42-year-old married man with children who has taken responsibility and built a solid party to be the third largest party without the support of white monopoly capital and the owners of the South African economy. You keep on referring to old and old things because you are now beginning to sound like a scratched CD. You have every right to tell, tell me, me of to me tell now. me you have changed. Tell me of me now. I've been let's in Parliament one, for 10 years. Let's take one particular aspect of your policy positions. Yes. Do you think aligning yourself with Vladimir Putin is going to be good for South Africa? But that's what it is now. South Africa is in alliance with Russia, with India, uh, with Brazil, with China. So why are you asking me as if it's a, some policy that is going to be implemented South Africa right after now. I took over? South Africa is in alliance with Russia now. South Africa right now calls itself non-aligned. In the context of the war, but these are two different things. South Africa is an ally of Russia. Now, the second question is, where does South Africa stand on the war? It says I'm non-aligned in relation to war, but Russia remains South Africa's friend. So we cannot create confusion around there. Don't create an impression that it is Malema who's going to come and create an alliance with Russia. But there are some very specific Actually, I will, if, if I may I will say go so. beyond that. I will go beyond the, the friendship with Russia and in the war, I will align with Russia and I will even supply the weapons to Russia. Because Russia is in a war with, with imperialism and any agenda that seeks to push back uh, imperialist agendas, it's well within the policies of the EFF. You say Quite clearly, I would arm Vladimir yes. Putin. Yes. You know that the International Criminal Court wants Vladimir Putin to face war crimes charges. Mm. It must start with Tony Blair. It must start with George Bush. It must go to Barack Obama. Then it can go to uh, Putin. So, so let's get this so straight. Let's You're be, saying to me and, that and your, a, your a, policy, a, if you were in power in South Africa, is quite simple that your enemy's enemy, and it seems you regard the US and its allies as the enemy, yes. your enemy's enemy yes. is your friend. Never mind if he's a suspected war criminal, never mind if the UN and the ICC say they have compelling evidence of Russian war crimes. You don't care. As far as you're concerned, my enemy's enemy no, is you, my friend. You, you're exaggerating, but, but another point which you don't want me to go there is that um, Tony Blair accepted that they were wrong about Saddam Hussein, uh, to an extent that he did a, an apology of a thug, right? You, you have never called for his arrest. A man admitting that I, w I was wrong. Uh, uh, to How many people died? Independent sovereign existence. He appears to believe that the best thing would be to revive an empire, the Soviet empire. But you're anti-imperialist? We are anti-imperialist. That's a debate for another day. Uh -huh. The war is not what he's talking The war is about the expansion. And had there been a, a, a common ground found, this could have been avoided. 
We are not for imperialism, even if it were to come from Russia. If he does that, we'll condemn it. But we know for a fact that progressive forces such as China have also aligned themselves uh, with Putin to try and create an alternative from the imperialist uh, domination of the world. And that's what the EFF is about. You admire China. You admire, it seems, Putin. What you seem to have as a vision for South Africa's future is much more along those lines, authoritarianism, than democracy. No, socialism is not authoritarianism. So, so how can you describe China as progressive? No, it's very progressive. China uh, subscribed to Leninism and Marxism, where uh, the working class control the commanding heights uh, of the economy. And that's what we subscribe for. We are of the means of production being owned and controlled by the states. We want South Africa through the vision and the image of China, where you grow the economy, where you reduce unemployment, where you reduce poverty, and you can't take that away uh, from China. And the state plays the central role uh, with regard to that. That kind of message and the messaging on Russia has seen the rand plunge against ah, the US dollar. <laughs> we, we, uh, hang on, we see many corporations in South Africa looking at establishing headquarters elsewhere. We see foreign direct investment flatlining in this country. Do you believe that the rhetoric you are using is good for the South African economy? I've been doing this from when you interviewed me 15 years ago when I was young. And therefore you can't say the uh, rent to dollar crisis uh, today is created by this message that I've been spreading for for so many years, from my early ages, and then this no, party but what I'm suggesting is that the new party... tensions between Washington and the government in South Africa have definitely affected the financial markets. No, it was the, uh, the crisis as we see it today, as we have this conversation, me and you, uh, it was worsened by the irresponsible utterances by the ambassador of the USA, who just recklessly, without following the... Uh, proto uh, proto diplomatic protocols uh, went mm. out to make certain allegations our, about our country, damaging its good image and then undermining its sovereignty in terms of choosing who its friends are. And today we see the rent being weak because of such utterances. Why would uh, the rent be weakened by a political uh, posture that says this is what we want to uh, uh, be when we take over government. We want a government that will be owned by the corrupt free. I admire China when it comes to how it deals with crime. I admire China when it comes to how it deals with infrastructural development. I admire China on how it has dealt with poverty and unemployment. How would that weaken the rent? Is that not what the investors want for all of us? The most likely way that you can get a grip on some power in this country is by forming a coalition with the ANC after the next election. You could have a role if you were to do a deal with the ANC. Are you ready to do it? The reality is that the EFF is the only organization that is growing and that the DA and the ANC, the DA, which is the official opposition, yep. ANC, which is the ruling party, are both significantly declining to a point where the DA called us the enemy number one. Why did they do so? Their own internal research tells them that the EFF has overtaken you. That's how much our policy position has attracted the people of South Africa. We are not going into coalition for positions. We are going to say anyone wants to work with us. And we've said this before, and that's why we're not working with anyone in the local governments. If you want to work with us, you are going to expropriate land without compensation. You are going to nationalize the mines. You are going to establish a state-owned bank. You are going to make sure that we fight crime fire by fire to make this country a safer place. Those are just but minimal, non-negotiable uh, points that will engage with anyone. Non-negotiable. All of non that. Non-negotiable. Non -negotiable. On that basis, it's hard to imagine you can make a coalition with anyone. ANC was more than willing. I actually ANC was at a point of signing with us 
on expropriation of land without compensation. Remember, we even put this in Parliament. How did it pass to a point where Parliament had to do an investigation if the ANC was not agreed? We were almost at the edge of getting a deal. And some young uh, ANC clowns uh, decided to uh, uh, vote against this. But we are not going to retreat in returning the land back into the hands of our people. And don't tell me about Zimbabwe. This is going to be done through a democratic means like we did in consultation with all South Africans, black and white, on how best do we get the rest of our people owning the land and other strategic sectors of the economy. You know there are some South Africans, and let us be blunt, many white South Africans yes. who fear Julius Malema. They, some of them have said to me, if Malema gets to power or close to power, I will leave this country. Do you welcome their fear or do you want to find ways to overcome their fear? I don't welcome their fear. Uh, Stephen, they said that about Mandela, the most celebrated Mandela. You're talking about me. They said if Mandela, a prisoner, becomes the president who are living in this country and they left. I was in uh, the Val River the other day yeah. looking at some of the houses that whites abandoned in 1994 when Mandela became a president. They are not scared of Julius Malema. They are scared of an independent black man who is not controlled by any white person, who is not controlled by London. Last year, you said this. It was after you'd questioned whether a particular white person, why they hadn't been located and, quote, taken to an isolated space where our supporters could attend to the guy properly. And you went on to say, you must never be scared to kill. A revolution demands that at some point there must be killing because killing is part of the revolutionary uh, uh, act. Absolutely. This was last year. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't say you're a revolutionary and then be scared to kill. But once you, you go killing uh, uh, people around, you are a terrorist. When you've got the support of the majority of your people to engage in war, and the majority of the people are with you, that is the revolution. It's not terrorism. And therefore, I'm not a terrorist. I'm, that's why I'm saying, at least for now, the conditions have not dictated that there should be anyone who should go to the bush and engage in war to kill. But if those conditions necessitate, will, will without hesitation, do that. The same way the generations before us, when conditions necessitated, they were not scared to take up guns and shoot to kill. So I'm not saying uh, anyone must be killed. All I'm saying is, let everybody come to the party. Let's build this one country and give away our privilege but for the it, privilege of question, all. Your vision of South Africa's future, will it come through the ballot box, or will it come through what you call a revolution? It will come through the ballot box. A ballot box that produces a revolutionary party will unleash the revolution. And the revolution, when it is unleashed through democratically elected government, is the changing of the system, where you radically uh, uh, defeat capitalism and introduce a socialist state. We still believe in the EFF, fundamentally so, that the power to the people must be ushered in through the ballot. And nothing else must be looked at except right. the ballot. However, when the need arises to defend ourselves through whatever means necessary, we'll do so without hesitation. Julius Malema, sadly, we're out of time, but I thank you very much for thank joining you. me on thank Hard you. Talk. Thank you. Thank you. From the French Riviera, highlights of this year's Cannes Film Festival. Johnny Depp attempting a career comeback in a French period film. Harrison Ford starring in the latest Indiana Jones franchise and African filmmakers making their voices heard. Join me, Tom Brook, for Talking Movies on BBC News. 
As India marches on to be the world's most populous country, coming behind is a mini revolution. Earlier pushed to the background, millions of women are now heading their families. Join me as I bring their stories in Women in Charge. Is India changing on BBC News? For 40 years, the BBC's Jeremy Bowen has reported from war zones around the world. He's been on the front line, not just of conflict, but in our partisan age of journalism's fight for the truth. The nature of modern war reporting is our subject on The Media Show on BBC News. El Salvador was the murder...